cool, cool. All right, so I'm gonna dig into our creative finance deals. And I keep on hearing from everybody in the industry, everybody keeps on saying that creative finance is gonna become more popular. It's gonna be just the next wave of how to invest with a potential downturn in the market. A lot of situations now when you're talking with sellers, they could list their house on the market. A lot of them still won't for one reason or another, but it's still a great option, right? But as the market starts to change, interest rates start to, to rise, the market starts to slow down, that option of putting your house on the market and it selling opening weekend is becoming less and less. You're hearing, you're hearing of more time on market, more inventory, more price deductions. So with this being a case, the creative way is going to be an, an excellent way to be able to make more deals. So the number that we're going to look at today, and real quick, anybody in here, I see we have Las Vegas here. So we got Rochester in the house, another Las Vegas. We got Dallas, we got Florida, we got Tampa. We got more Rochester. We got some Rochester peeps in here. I know I got some Buffalo friends in here too. Um, Sacramento, California. We got Canada, Minnesota, pretty cool. Uh, we got Philadelphia in here, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Oh, nice down there. Um, cool, cool. It's just really good to see Sarasota. Hey, Bill, we're going to be your new neighbor in two weeks. We're going to be moving down there. Um, that's why we have construction. If you hear any hammering or stuff like that, I got construction guys in my house doing some stuff. Uh, we got Missouri. Got a lot of cool stuff going on here, guys. Great to see. So sometimes I ask this too, because when I get asked a question, some of these are going to you know, be of, of where you are located. So whenever somebody goes over a deal, I always think that you, know, you should go over the full deal, the, the details, the address. So if anybody has... Zillow or Google. If not, I'm going to pull up on my screen, but it's going to be um, 269 Nunda Boulevard, Rochester, New York. That's the property we're going to be talking about today, and I will share screens. It's 269 N-U-N-D-A Boulevard. You know what I'm going to do? I might even put that down in the comments. So what I'd like you all to do is pull up this property. So we're going to go over a history of this property. I'm going to go over how the lead came into us, how we had handled this lead. I just dropped it in the comments, everybody. 269 Nunda Boulevard. So the lead comes into us, reaches out through Facebook. We do a big Facebook page, says that we buy houses. We have a rent to own page. We're pretty well known in our area from just sharing with the community who it is and what we do. So the seller reached out to us and said, I have a house that I wanna sell. Um, we ask, you know, what's the address? He gives us the address. It's 269 Nunda Boulevard. So when we pull up the house, I can see some photos online. It's an absolutely beautiful house. It's in my own city. It is really in the ritzy part of town. The mayor of the city lives in the same street. The code enforcement for a lot of the city lives within the next block or two over. A lot of the city officials all live that street or the next one over pretty much. There's a handful of these houses that are just beautiful in this area. Um, and it's close to like all the stuff too. So this is why it's really a, a hot spot. So with that being the case, you know, when you're, it's a, it's a higher end property, it's not a, a medium to lower range, which I typically prefer for that first time buyer. This is definitely a, a higher end property, but I also love these two, right? So the seller reaches out to us and we ask the typical questions, you know, can you tell me about the property? And he goes into, and I guess what I could do, um, he explains it's a four bedroom house, it's large, it's about 2,700 square feet, plus it has a finished basement and a finished attic. Two, base, two, two bathrooms in the basement, even a, a, a bathroom in the attic. He said, I was currently using it as an Airbnb and the, with the property being almost four floors and almost 5,000 square feet, when folks did move out, it just took too long of a turnover time to clean the entire house. He was getting three to $400 a night on the weekends for the property. So he said the, the money was great. It was just the turnaround time. And what he really figured out for his personal business, he wanted to specialize closer to colleges where there were smaller homes where he was having a lot of parents coming in and out because our city is there's a college town too. So he's like, I want to sell. So on Zillow, they had it listed on the market prior to us buying it, right? And they had this listed for, with a realtor in our town, um, he had it listed for, let me pull it up. He buys it for $250,000. So he buys it for $250,000 in 2019, 
right before the pandemic happens. In 2020, a little over a year later, right as the fall of the pandemic happens, he lists it for sale. He had it for sale for about three weeks. And he says the market was just the fall of 2020. It was a little strange, except for, for a high-end property. And he was like, it wasn't working out with a realtor and a realtor was a friend. So he's like, I deactivated the listing. He's like, I'm going to reach out to you guys because I saw your Facebook page. And he reached out and said, hey, I know you guys buy houses. Would you be interested in something like this? So we asked him the question. He said, I just had it listed for 290, didn't sell. He's like, I really want to get 300 for the property, but I would take 290. I said, would you be open to seller financing? He said, I would be open to seller financing. I said, great, I'm going to come out and see the house. So I go see the property. I do a walkthrough. The walkthrough is all of 10 minutes. It's a gorgeous house in a gorgeous neighborhood. And I'm going to share those photos with you if you ever already pulled it up so we can see that. The conversation goes as such that the seller wants 290000 for the property. I mentioned him with, two, with seller financing because he was making this $1,700 payment, but he stopped the Airbnb business because it was too much of a turnover. So now what is the pain? He has a vacant house that he's paying utilities on. He's got a $1,700 payment he's paying to Wells Fargo every month. And the utilities are probably two to 300 a month in the place to keep it heated during the, the time of the year, fall, November and upstate New York, it gets cold up here, guys. It's snowing, right? So to heat uh, a big house like that's expensive. So you're, you're talking probably $2,000 a month coming out of his pocket. And when he went to put it on the market for the first few weeks, it didn't sell like he was hoping to. So once we explained to him that we could close quickly when he's ready, and that we could take over that $1,700 payment. That was music to his ears. He was hitting the easy button. We're going to take the property as is. Now we had it furnished because it was an Airbnb, but he was going to take out most of that furniture with him. But any of the stuff he didn't want, he was going to plan on leaving it behind. Um, and there really wasn't much at all. Really, we had to clean out a couple of small things and hang up smoke alarms. That's all we did to the place. Because um, they did take most of the furniture with them because you don't have it too much stuff there because it was just as an Airbnb, right? So we agree on the 290 price, but he owed 230 on it. So that seller had $60,000 of equity in that deal. Now, when I spoke to the seller, I said, you know, you're, you have equity. We're going to buy it for 290, but you owe 230. The way this works is I'm going to buy it for 230. We're going to agree on that price. That's what I'm going to buy it for. Now, I typically buy with no money down, okay? And he said, okay. So I said, fine. I'm going to buy for 290. I'll pay closing costs. I'm going to take over that $1,700 payment. And I'm going to make that rather I'm going to rent it. I might put a rent to own buyer in it because he says, I see you do rent to own. I see you help people out. He's like, so, you know, are you going to do that with the house? I said, probably most likely. He said, good. I hope you do. I hope you make a lot of money on it too. He said that. So now what we did was I bought this house and I put it in our main picture for this. But if you look, that's the closing statement for this house. It's got the address. It's got the land trust. I mean, I didn't hide any of it. It's right in there. The total closing costs were a little over 5,200 bucks, guys. So without bank financing, I never got my credit checked. And I just bought a three, four hundred thousand dollar house that's turnkey and beautiful in a beautiful neighborhood for 5,200 bucks. And all I have to do is take over a $1,700 payment. Now, which is easily doable because now what's the exit strategy, right? So he reached out to us. We asked the questions if he'd be open to seller financing. He said, yes, I go on the appointment, I go see the house. Now, these houses, because we do a lot of this virtually, a lot of these appointments are on a Zoom call or a FaceTime call, right? This one was in my own city, so I went to the property. But the only reason why I do is because I know that they're open to terms, right? And we've had a discussion on the phone. Now I just need to do a walkthrough and kind of finalize the last few things. So $5,200 out of pocket on this deal. So now what we do is take over that $1,700 payment. So I'm going to take it to the very end of it to where what we started doing was we started looking for a tenant buyer. These are folks who are going to plan on moving to the house now. They're going to rent it from us with the intentions that they're going to buy in a handful of years. So what happens is we collect what's called a non-refundable option deposit. Now that non-refundable option deposit is going to go towards the purchase if and when they decide to purchase the property. So what we did was our agreement, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute on Zillow, the listing, the Zestimate shows it's worth about 400000 so that's the price we sold it to them for was for $400,000. That's the agreement that we have. They've got that price locked in for two years. We run a background on them through screenthetenant.com. Screenthetenant.com charges them 50 bucks 
per applicant, not us. Um, we got that snapshot back and they say at screenthetenant.com, these people are gonna need 12 to 18 months to get mortgage ready. And this is the reason why they're not ready yet. At this price house with this much money down, they will afford this payment. So the numbers are all fine. They need some help with X, Y, Z. And it could be self-employment. They need more income. It could be more time on the job. It could mean credit repair. It could be a series of different things. Everyone's a little bit different. In the meantime, on this property now, we buy it with 5,200 out of pocket. We did put an insurance policy on there. We did make a handful of these payments while we look for this tenant buyer. When I ran the numbers for everything for us, it was a little over $10,000 that we had to have totally out because we made three payments and we had to pay an insurance policy, right? And then pay that $5,200. But making those handful of payments, now we found a tenant buyer who gave us 28,000 to move in. So that money is now ours. You will get tax on it. It does go towards the purchase if they do to execute that. It's non-refundable. So if they decide to move out or not to execute it for any other reason, they know they're not getting that back. It's your money to spend right away. So if you want to reinvest in other properties, you can. You will be taxed on it. So make sure you set aside money for that. But the nice thing about that is now our tenant buyer is responsible for the maintenance, repairs, utilities, not us. It's like they already own the house. The toilet gets plugged. They, they know to call a plumber, not us. It's part of our agreement. Now, we don't have them give us $28,000 of the kitchen. We don't have them sign this paperwork at the house. They sit in front of an attorney, which is our attorney. They pay $375 for it, which they do. So they know when they go to closing, they bring their first month's rent, the down payment, and a separate check for $375 that's made payable to the attorney's office. They show up to the closing at the attorney's office. And what they do is they sit down with our attorney, and our attorney goes through the agreements line by line. Here's your lease. Here's your option to buy paperwork. Here's your deposit. It goes towards this. Sign here. They go over line by line to make sure that everything's very clear to our tenant buyers. They know they're responsible for what they're responsible for. They also know how important timing is for our payment goes. They also understand the precautions if, if they don't pay on time, what happens there. So we make it very clear on everybody's part to make sure we're all on the same page, which after we go through that process, it's, it's fairly easy if you've done it enough times. But once you do take the time to install the right tenant buyer, they pay us $3,000 a month for rent. Because on a $400,000 property, your mortgage is going to be slightly higher than that on this one because our taxes in our city are kind of high. So does anybody remember what our payment was that we were making to Wells Fargo? $1,700. There we go. Mike got it. So we're cash flowing close to like $1,200 a month on that property. Right? So what did it cost me to buy that? 5,200 and something dollars. You've seen the closing statements on the ad for this thing. If I didn't put in a tenant buyer and I just wanted to live there, because I ran it by my wife, I said, do you want to live here? She says, well, it's a beautiful house, but it's not warm enough. And if we're going to move, we're moving from New York to Florida. So in two weeks, we're going to be moving to Florida. Um, but if not, if we were staying in the city, that's a beautiful house. So it was one that we considered moving into. Um, but long story short, our tenant buyers are, so they buy for 400,000. They still owe us quite a bit of money because $20,000 down. We cash flow $1,200 a month. And then once our tenant buyer does qualify for a mortgage down the road, which I know some great mortgage people in my city, so I, I do hook them together when the timing is right and they've gone through all the credit repair or whatever is needed, right? And they do have a little preliminary sit down. We have that game plan set up. So we have a, a plan for in 24 months, they're going to get us cashed out. Now, that's a call by call basis. I will say that because with our term with my seller, he did give us a 30 year term. So if my buyer doesn't get me cashed out in two years, guys, I could keep them in there for another 28 years and it'd be no problem. So do I want to push my person out quickly to get that six figure back end check when they refinance? I mean, it would be nice to get that check, but also I really love getting 1200 bucks a month every single month, right? The next part I'm going to write off, talk about is writing off depreciation. Does anybody know how that works? Yes. Um, so to answer real quick, yes, that is, uh, it's, a, it's a sub two. It's actually, I bought that in a wrap mortgage. Um, so it's close to sub two. Um, the difference is with that wrap mortgage, I wrapped my whole purchase price around 290. Um, but the purchase price was 290. So when you're figuring out depreciation, the way that it is figured is you get your selling price. So the selling price of this property that we bought it for was for $290,000. Anybody have a calculator? 
might want to get a calculator out for this one. Okay. So how we figure out depreciation is we have to figure out the actual cost of the building. So what I generally do is I take out 10% for the land. Okay. When I'm figuring out the cost on that. So what I do with my 290 price, if I'm going to remove 10% of that for the land, I'm going to multiply it times 0.9. Okay. So 0.9 gives me $261,000 that I get to divide that by 27.5 years. Because that's how they work with that, okay? So that means every year off my taxes from buying this property, I also get to write off almost 95, where is it? Almost $9,500 a year, I get to write off my taxes. So when I'm looking at depreciation for the next 27 and a half years, I'm writing, it only cost me $5,000 to get into this deal, right? Even 10, if I use the other amount, I got all that money back. I'm profitable instantly. And I get to write off $10,000 a year off my taxes and depreciation. So when you look at a lot of these really successful real estate investors, how are they able to write no taxes? How are they able to pay no taxes? I know some people love, some people hate Donald Trump. But when they talk about how he doesn't pay taxes, a lot of it has to do with his real estate holdings, right? And what you're able to depreciate. So it's a lot of accountants that are able to do this. So once again, when you look at the purchase price of all the properties that you're buying and you're, everybody's looking at the monthly cash flow, which is important, but I'm also looking at depreciation to help minimize how much I'm paying per year in taxes, because it's not just making it, it's about how much you're going to save and obviously paying more in taxes. I like to pay as less as possible. So uh, what was the calculation for depreciation? Heather, good question. We get the purchase price of the property that we paid for the property. We subtract 10% off that. That's going to be what the land value is roughly. So the 90% that's left over, we are going to divide that number by 27 and a half years. And that's what you're going to be able to write off per year. Now, if you are in a 25 or 30% tax bracket, you think of what that say ten thousand dollars. That's twenty five hundred dollars. You're not writing to the government that stays in your pocket at the end of the year. Times how many properties you own, right? And this is why I love buying real estate subject to or seller financing because a lot of our deals, as you can see, like this one, I don't have to put twenty percent down. I don't have to put a, a huge amount of money down. And then not only that too. I'm going to get taxed because I'm going to have a lot of income on my properties. And the reason why is because my payment on this property is only 1700 where if I were to buy that property, even at his 290 price at a 6% interest rate is what it is now, it'd be a much higher payment than that 1700 The interest rate on that loan, I believe, is only a 275 that we took over. Because that's when he bought it years ago, when rates were still at 275 and 3.2 and all that good stuff. So part of the other reason why I love buying properties with subject to and wrap mortgages are even in the market today where interest rates are five, six, even I've seen 7% on one recently, um, we're still taking down most of our deals in the twos, the threes. So how are we able to still get great interest rates? This is the way we're able to do this, even in a downturn. So my question to everybody is right now, would everybody still be buying real estate if you could get a 3% interest rate compared to what happened was when it turned up to six and 7% and everybody's like, oh, geez, I don't know if I want to do that, right? That's not as fun, which I get it, right? I've been a part of both sides. I've been doing this for 20 something years. So I've seen it do this a handful of times. And in 2006 and seven and eight, interest rates were, you know, five, 6% and the market was still pretty hot. So, but would I buy houses and deals right now at 3%? I sure would. And this is where I love our business of what we do with what we call pretty houses or subject to because now, my question to a lot of other investors are, what happens when you have a house, and I want to share my screen. Um, let's see if I can do that now. I think I got rid of it. Um, but the point of it, when you look at the pictures of this house, where can you get a beautiful house that's turnkey? And when you're a wholesaler or a cash person looking to make these deals, you're looking to get a substantial discount. And these folks know that their house is worth good money. He knows that I'm going to make money on the deal. He said, I hope you do because I follow your page now. So they know what our intentions are. He's seen our new tenant buyers in the house because we always take pictures with them. Congratulations on their new house, right? So we always make fun, the situation great. So we broadcast it, we advertise it. They know what we're doing with the property. He loves the fact he turned over the key. He's got $60,000 
sitting in the bank of ours until we get them cashed out. In the meantime, we're taking care of that two grand got off his back every month. And we did it quick and made it easy. So once again, can we pay full price or top price? You'll see that on some of our marketing guys. Yeah, we can. And the reason why is because when he says, I want 300,000, but I'll take 290, I said, fine. No money down, 30 year term, $1,700 payment on a gorgeous house. I'll do that every day, all day long. I wish I could have 10 of these a month, guys. And we try to, it's not always that easy. Some deals are good like this. Some are, are you need a little bit of money down depending on the situation. Um, so when does the seller get their equity, Eric? The seller gets their equity once my tenant buyer gets them refinanced and gets them gets all of us cashed out. So the seller gave us a 30 year term to get them cashed out. Now, some sellers we work with want to get paid off a lot sooner, like 10, 15 years. Some sellers are like, hey, listen, you're going to take care of everything. I'll wait. But they also know on the other side is that once those buyers of ours do get us cashed out, that's when we get a big check too. So obviously it's in our best interest to make sure it's not like, you know, 40 years from now, I want to get sooner than later. Um, so why would the seller agree to those terms you outlined? Because I hope maybe I just answered that a second ago, but if not, they were happy because they have a $2,000 payment between their mortgage, the house is sitting there vacant, and it was a failed Airbnb business, as he said, because he didn't want to do it there anymore. And they tried to list on the market and it didn't sell that fast. So he was thrilled that we were taking that debt off his back and knew it was in good hands. And sometimes that all it takes. Um, and was he simply not able to sell and was going into foreclosure? They weren't going to go into foreclosure. He was making the payment. He's got 60000 of equity, so you wouldn't want to lose that. Um, you know, he could have sold it for two fifty and walked away with nothing if he put it on the market. But at that point, or even 260 or 275, and so it's probably a little cheap, but he knew he had a nice house and knows that if he has 60,000 of equity sitting in the bank right now, and he's going to wait for that, it's better than getting almost nothing now for it. It was his thought on it. And it was way easier and fast. So what I realize a lot of times too, is why people will trade uh, time and speed and convenience for dollars. And this is why when I go to a restaurant, a really nice restaurant, you know, I'll tip the guy $10 to bail in my car. You know, I'll pay people to, to do my lawn. And like, I have people right now painting my house. I could paint my house, but I'd rather be here with you guys talking about this stuff than, than, than painting a room. So I pay other people to do this stuff because of the speed, the time, and the convenience. And there's a lot of situations where I stop trying to ask why and try to really figure out why, but some people want to hit the eject easy button and be done with it. And as somebody who's selling my house right now, I'm getting my house market ready. So does that mean I have a dumpster in my driveway, getting rid of all the stuff that we don't want anymore? So the fact that I could offer that to a seller is really, really nice. The fact that I don't have to worry about putting on the market, having a million people do a walkthrough, that you're dealing directly with the buyer, that's a really, really good feature to have with some folks. So that's an easy button. They're thrilled with that. So these are the small differences, what really make that convenience for a buyer, if that makes sense. Um, I got it, the seller got out of his pain and uh, he's losing their money every month. And that's really the name of it too. So uh, what was the term for the 30 year seller finance interest, et cetera. So the seller finance, what we do is we agree to the price. We're going to make that $1,700 payment for the next 30 years. And the debt on the, his loan is only at 275. So that's the rate we're paying. And the neat thing about it is too, because we own the house, even though the loan is in his name, we still get to write off the interest every year. Our accountant says how much interest was paid on that. We get him to send over the statement. And we send that to the accountant and say, here is how much interest it was paid on that account. And we own it. So they write that off too for us. So it's really amazing if you do it all right. Um, do you use private money lenders? Uh, we don't use private money lenders because in that situation, Julie, for us, it was only about the five grand we needed. And, you know, the couple payments. So we had the 10,000 where you could do that. So for me, if I had to borrow the 10,000 and I had an extra strategy like a rent to own where I knew I'd get a big down payment from somebody, you know, I could do that. I could borrow 10,000 from somebody, know I'm gonna get a 10, 20, $30,000 down payment from somebody and do that there. And these are the lot of situations that we're finding. And I'll go over a last quick one that I really didn't plan on getting to, but just one that's coming up right now today that I just talked to. Um, we have a deal in Greenwood, Greenville, Louisiana. It's on our favehomebuyers.com. It's a double wide, it's like 2,600 square feet. 
uh, 202 something is the address. So we had this out there for everybody. Anybody who wanted a deal, it was available. And my dispo manager says, Joe, I can't find anybody who wants this deal. So I said, fine, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do a little docu-series on how we did this deal. So the seller wants 70,000 for the property because they owe like 62 or 63 on it. So if we give the seller $7,000 at closing, they're able, they're letting us take over their $500 payment on a double wide, it's like 2,600 square feet built in 05 with a new roof on it. So when I start looking at the area, one this size sells for about 140 to 150 if it's done real, real nice. The one that's 1,600 square feet, it's 1,000 square foot less, just sold for 130 and they bought it for 83. So they bought it for 83, they put 15 into it, sold it for 130. So our deal though is I'm gonna do what's called a subtail or whatever you wanna call it. So I'm buying the subject to where I'm giving them their seven grand down. I'm gonna pay two grand in closing. I've got $9,000 out of pocket. We haven't even closed on it yet. I'm, I called the, uh, we're closing it this week or at the beginning of next week, I gotta check. I call up a realtor in the area, I said, hey, I saw that you were a part of this other deal in the same street. I'm buying this property next week. I'm gonna be closing on it soon. And then sometimes I rent it and I can, because my payment's only 500 bucks a month on this. And I know I can rent it for more, but sometimes I just sell it as is. I'll just do a clean out and I'll just list it with a realtor right away in the market and I'll get it sold. And sometimes I like doing that option too. So I haven't decided yet. So I want to get your idea of what you think this property is worth. What do you think I could sell it for if you have a buyer? He says, I do have a buyer. He would definitely take it. He bought the last one and he tells me I'll take, he'll take it for 90,000. You just pay me a $1,500 flight on it. He already did a walkthrough, so he'll take it. So now I'm buying it for 70, right? The only cost above the 70 is really the two grand in closing costs. Regardless how much money I gave them, that comes off my balance. But the two grand and over is I have into it probably 72, maybe 73 with an insurance policy. And I've got my buyer already locked in at 90,000. So what will I do? I'll take $2,500. I'm going to take my $7,000 down for the closing. So it's about 9,500. I'll pay 500 bucks for an insurance policy. I'll have 10 grand out of pocket. I might make a payment to two payments tops. So say that's 11,000 out of pocket. So if I borrow 12 grand from mom, I don't have to, I just borrow from myself, but you know, whomever, friends or family or money lenders or whoever, if I borrow 12 grand on this deal. I'm going to take that 12 grand and buy that deal, have my insurance payments. Meanwhile, my buyer is already lined up for 90. I'm at net 87. By the time I'm all said and done, I'm going to have 15,000, a little over that. And then you pay tax on it, right? But how can I get into some of these creative deals where I'm just literally getting the same amount of money? And if I think about this, how I could turn an $11,000 into a $15,000 profit very easily by finding these, what they call sub tail deals, where I'm just finding them on sub two. I don't have to come up with a full 70,000 to buy the property to turn around and resell it. I'm only coming up with the closing costs and sometimes a small down payment, a couple of payments, and then I'm selling it right away. So these are one of our favorite actor strategies too, but you have to make sure your numbers line up. But here's opportunities, guys, where we've had this out there for the public. Anybody could have done that deal. Anybody could grab that one and, and held on to it for a rental. Um, but this is why we're doing this education is to kind of show you some of these opportunities that are coming across. So when you go to fave, F-A-V-E, homebuyers, Dot com, favehomebuyers.com. This is where we share off all the deals. This is the purpose why we made this group was to share more of these deals that we're finding. So some of you who might want these, who want to learn how to get them, we're going to be here to teach you how to get them and how we're finding them, right? But we're also going to say, hey, if you want some of these delivered to you on a silver platter, here they are. Go to our Facebook group, the Creative Finance Playbook with Joe and Jen. And we have our students, Mike and Jay. We have a lot of our students, Grace, and a lot of other rock star students, they're going to post their deals in that group too. So if you see any of these deals being posted in that group, the Creative Finance Playbook by Jen and Joe, you're going to see by myself or some of my dispo team, you're going to see Mike and Jay's dispo team, and you're going to see these deals in that group. So if you see seller finance available, it's not just some spam thing, guys. These are us or our students advertising some of these deals because what happens is if we find seven deals or eight deals or 10 deals a month. I can't close on all 10 of those myself. I'd love to, and we're trying, but there's, it's just impossible. So a lot of these deals, we, we just assign them out to other investors. And a lot of these deals are money-making deals that you're going to be able to walk into with very little to no cash. Some need a little bit of money. Some are cash deals where they're just the traditional cash sale too. 
but a lot of these deals are creative finance. And on these creative finance, we try to keep your entry fee as low as possible. So what's an entry fee? My entry fee for that one deal with the first one we talked about was $5,200 and insurance policy, three payments, 1700 bucks. Right now, if you had a down payment, you'd include in there too. We have that cost of entry form in our, on our group. Look it up. It's in there guys. When we do a creative deal, this is what we fill out every time. So when I'm talking with my team, I say, what's the cost of entry in this deal? And they're going to say it's, you know, $12,000. I know I'm not guessing, right? What's roughly closing? What's roughly insurance policy? I could be off a couple hundred, but I'm not going to be off tens of thousands. If there's any repairs that need to get done, that has to be on that cost of entry, right? Okay. It needs a new roof. At least I know it needs a roof. So I'm going to figure that into my cost of entry if I'm going to be doing that. So it's important to know that. So, but for you guys, our deals, we try to keep the cost of entry as low as possible because it keeps it easier for you to get into deals. So why do I love this subject too? Rather than spending a whole bunch of your money going into a bank, getting a loan and trying to bid for some property, what's much better is where you could use a very little money, no credit, no banks involved, and you're able to get into a cash flowing property that's turnkey or pretty darn close to it. And during this downturn where everybody's being fearful of the market and all the buyers are going to start pulling out, the investors, the hedge funds are already doing it. If you're a big time investor, you've gotten letters from hedge funds saying we're no longer buying. That's happening a lot across the country. You're having a lot of folks who are just tired of the market and they're paying 6% and they're, they've pulled out. So now who are the folks who are going to be left for buying? The ones who are going to do the very best are the ones who are going to be able to buy in abundance and still get 2 to 3% interest rates or better sometimes. So this is why I really truly believe moving forward subject to all the creative financing things that we're going to be doing. This is a way to beat that downturn and still do amazing things. And they constantly say is, you know, you buy when there's blood in the streets and that's kind of what we've been looking at. Um, did you see my question? Any chance about sub two and the lender wanting the money, the full money for the original loan? I did not, Sarah, let me scroll up. Sarah. Okay, since that is a sub two, have you ever had a lender come and ask for the full mortgage to be paid since it changed hands? I heard that's a risk with sub two. Sarah, that's a good question. So uh, you're talking about calling the loan due or acceleration clause. Every mortgage has that. It's written right in there. It's very hardly ever, ever executed unless two things happen. And there's ways to get around it if it does. So the two things that doesn't happen are the reason why it does happen. Number one, the bank doesn't get payment. Bank doesn't get payment. Yeah, they're going to have, they're going to want their money, right? So if you buy a property subject to, and I take over this mortgage like we did, and then I stop making payments, it's going to go to somebody's lap and they're going to say, wait a minute, why is this person defaulting on payments? And then, oh, wait a second, the deed transferred. We're calling that loan due. We need our money. What's going on here? Right? So that's a sure way of getting that loan call due. So first way, don't do that. Number two, it's insurance. It's one of these two things is why they get called due. There's a couple smaller intricate things you have to look out for once you know better, but if you don't have insurance set up properly, okay? So how we have insurance set up on our deals like this is we have our insurance policy on the property because the old owner is no longer the owner of the property anymore. Their insurance policy is null and void, right? They're not the owner. Who owns the property? We do now. So I have an insurance policy through my company, my LLC, for that property. Now, the difference is I have the seller on my insurance policy, guys. This is the success in the details. Here it is. I'm spelling this out for you, so make sure you do this right. The insurance policy is under my LLC, but I have the seller's name and address on there as additionally insured. And I say their current address where they're currently living at that point, not the property address we just bought. So additionally insured is the seller's name and their current address where they live as additionally insured with that insurance policy being under my LLC. So now the insurance company sees that there's proper insurance on there. No problem, Sarah. Uh, the insurance company sees there's proper insurance on the property. The seller's name's on there is additionally insured. Payments are coming in on time. Guys, properties, they do not want, banks do not want properties back. My history before I was in finance and banking for almost 20 years, I know banks really well. And when they take a property back, how much cost they incur, they go for that for maintenance and all the other things that they have to take care of. Same thing if they repo your car, 
you think, oh, they're going to turn around and sell it at auction. It's not just that easy. They get a very, they, they lose a big chunk taking these properties back and banks are in lending. They're not in repossession. They have to do a repossession when deals go bad, but they don't want to. So if you're making your payments on time, there's that. Number two, what happens in that one out of a thousand that does happen, right? You're paying the payments on time. The insurance is right, but you're with small town, local bank USA, and this is going on, right? Because there's that, people get struck by lightning, right? One out of a million, but it happens, right? So with that being the case, this is the reason why we love deeding our properties into land trusts rather than an LLC. If I deed the property to a land trust, I could just add the seller to my land trust as an additional beneficiary. At any point, I can make a quick change to a trust document, have that forwarded to a bank and have them completely legally off my back. So I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Pace Morby. I have, he's a great dude, does a lot of cool stuff. He talks about how there's sub two insurance for this stuff to happen. If anybody's been to the casino, they tell you when you're playing blackjack, do you want insurance? It's kind of like one of those things as far as I see it because you know how insurance goes, right? And if you listen to the claim, they always say that they will either rectify the problem for you or they will refinance it themselves. And then you hear the real meat potatoes of it. All they do is just do what I just said. They don't refinance it. They have the ability to, but they never do because they just have it done this way. They deed it back to the seller and they'll do it to a land contract to where the deed doesn't transfer to the deal is over. So you can still do it that way or a deed for sales, what they call it in some states, depending on where you are. Or if you do it the way we do it was we deed that property to a land trust and I can add them to it as additionally, or I'm sorry, as an additional beneficiary. I know some of that's going way over your head. If it does, this is recorded, play this stuff back. If there's more questions on this, write it down. We'll talk about it more, right? If this is something that's important to you. But I will say is if that comes to fruition for us on one of our deals where the bank does call it due, and eventually if you do it enough times, a thousand times, yeah, you're probably gonna have it happen once or twice. And if it does, we're well prepared. And there's no reason when it does happen, because I almost prepare for when it does happen, that I don't wanna feel like I'm in a house that's on fire and I'm just running around scrambling, just trying to save my life to get out. I want to be like, okay, you know where the fire exit is, go that way. You're all not panicking. This is just what happens, right? So we have the game plan in place by if it ever were to happen, how do we address that? And that's exactly how we do. So this is recorded. I will make sure that we share this in the group for all of you. Um, but this is some good tips. So how do we prevent that from happening? We set up insurance the right way. We set up payments the right way. Another tip for payments is if payments and everything is escrowed, you're going to want that seller to send you their statement every month automatically. You're gonna want the bank to send it to you. Because what happens when there's a change in escrow and you have the same old payment going out every month, you didn't notice that your payment went up 24 bucks. All right, and then you've been shorting the bank 24 bucks for the last four months and not knowing, All right? Because they had a change in escrow because insurance or the shortage or overage or taxes change or something like that. So a foolproof way to make sure that you're always making sure the payment is correct is make sure you get their statement sent to you every month. Make sure that it matches the amount that you've got going out on time every month. And uh, insurance is good and there's no issues. Um, if you don't wanna buy and hold, do you wholesale these deals as well? Just assign the contract at closing. Eric, yes, we do. So a lot of our deals we do like to buy and hold. Some I like to buy and hold longer than others. Some I want to keep super, super long-term. Some are more of a medium range for me. And then some are a little bit quicker. And then there are some that we just wholesale to. And then if we do, we would assign these terms to our end buyer, which is a lot of you guys. So what does that look like? We, we do lock down a deal with an investor, or I'm sorry, with a seller. So for an example, that one we just looked at, Nunda Boulevard. If somebody wanted that deal on Nunda Boulevard, we could assign that to somebody for, I don't even know whatever the fee would start off at. And usually if there's a lot of people interested to say, Hey, I'll pay this for it. And you get to a 10, 15, $20,000 fee. So if you had the $5,000 for closing, you had a $15,000 assignment fee. So you've got $20,000 down. You could be into that Nunda Boulevard deal. Give us our 15 grand. And that's your payment at 1700 bucks. And you guys can make the 1200 a month. And then you could sell it for more or Airbnb it, or just go move into it and be your own house. Cause it's a beautiful house and you love it. We have Wegmans up here in upstate New York. And if you've gone to grocery stores before, 
you don't know what you're missing until you've seen Wegmans. Um, and it's like right down the street from like nice ones too. So it's a pretty cool area. Um, but that's kind of why we have so many different options to do that. In New York, uh, does that work no double closing with, with no double closing? So on a wrap deal, if I buy it on a wrap, I could sell it to you with me being in the middle still, but I usually don't do it that way. If I'm going to sell my property that I own, I'm going to do that with a rent to own lease purchase because in New York state where I'm from, if somebody doesn't pay me, what, how do you get the property back the fastest way? Is it foreclosure or is it through a eviction? And so when I'm looking at, when I'm selling one of our properties that I own on a subject to, what's my action strategy? Am I going to sell this to somebody on seller financing? I don't. If I'm going to work with somebody who plans on living in the house, they're going to get it on a rent to own because I know in New York state, me having to evict somebody is a lot faster than if I have to foreclose on somebody. But now if I'm going to be assigning that contract and it's one of our seller finance deals, you're taking over that seller finance deal. So you get the deed, you get the property, you're taking it over just as we would be buying ourselves. Um, so there's no double closing in New York. Mike, to answer your question, what I would do is I'd say at closing or well before closing, we use attorneys here. And all we do is we bring all the documents to closing, letting them know that we are assigning our agreement over to Mike. Mike is taking over this deal as these terms as agreed. The seller has met our buyer. They both like and approve of each other. Mike knows the seller is X, Y, Z. The seller knows Mike is going to be the one closing that property in his LLC. He's going to be one to make the payments. He's going to be a landlord with the property. They all are on the same page. Everybody loves Sings, Sans Kubaya. We're good to go to closing. If Mike says, or my seller says, I don't like your buyer because whatever reason, well, then obviously we have a problem because it's not a one and done cash deal. We're just exchanging cash. These are long-term relationships. So we make sure when we're working with sellers that we make sure our sellers have full disclosure of what's going on because what you don't want to have ever happen is a seller come back to you and say, I didn't know this, that, or the other thing. And the same thing goes with our buyers. We make sure there's full transparency on both sides. And these are how you keep these transactions smooth as can be, which they're still tricky. There's still a lot of intricate parts on there because it's not just me showing up with cash and then we're done and we never see each other again. These are where I'm taking over your payments. So if I'm having somebody take over payments, I need to make sure that they're an established person to do that. So what we're going to be going over next Tuesday is how do we screen our buyers? What do we look for our buyers? And I'm going to go over a nightmare story of what we just dealt with between Thursday and up until today. But long story short, we have a property that I had to find somebody who had a million dollars in cash and able to close within like six hours. And now let me tell you something, guys, if you have a lot of stuff going on on one deal and wait till you hear this story, your mind is going to explode. So you're not going to want to mess next Tuesday at two o'clock because I'm going to go over this story on a million dollar property in Florida that we're just closing. And then I'm also going to go over all the things that we learned from this and how we're screening buyers, including if one of you decide to buy our deal, like what will you need to know to learn to buy one of these deals? What should you look for? What's going to happen is if I have a sub two deal, and I'm going to assign that. And somebody says, you know, one of you guys, I'll give you a $10,000, $20,000 fee. Are you going to want to make sure that buyer is the right person to take over that obligation of making those payments? So what is it that we look for, right? What's the screening that we do to make sure that either one of you are going to be able to buy this deal or whoever the buyer is, right? And then I'm going to share with you a heck of a story that you're not going to want to miss because it's still unfolding. It looks like everything's going beautiful, but you know how real estate is until it's done and done and done and the dust settles, it's never truly done. And I believe it's done because I've got like a ton of text messages. Um, talk about money being wired right now, million dollars and it's all being done. So holy cow, but what a day. If I look like I lost hair this weekend, I did. I did me by ripping some of it out, but it looks like we're good. But what a story. So next Tuesday, we're going to go over that a lot more in depth, guys. 
Um, I really want to do this every Tuesday at two o'clock. So if there's something that you want to talk about more and more, please drop some comments or shoot a message in our, in our group, the Creative Finance Playbook with Jen and Joe. This will be aired on there too. Once again, guys, if you're looking for any of our deals, um, they're going to be shared in that group and on favehomebuyers.com. So I'll make sure you have all those links in there too. I've really noticed it seems like the most that we really want to dive into is the biggest two is lead generation. Because that's always everybody's. I know when I first got started, boy, that was a son of a gun. It was lead gen. How do I find these people? Right. But the bigger thing is once I find them, how do I structure these deals? How do I know if this is a good deal? How do I know if this is a bad deal? What does this look like to me? And I kind of dive into how we're structuring deals. So if you haven't seen some of these previous classes we did in the last few weeks, definitely go back. They're all saved. But this is where we dive into how we analyze these deals. And we're going to do a lot more of these too, because the how I analyze them, if you look at 100 leads, you might not see one deal. I might see four. Somebody else might see one. It all depends on how well sharpened the trained eye is on how we could structure these things and be creative. And the more creative you get, the more creativity you could put into these deals, the more situations you can make these things work. And it comes with not just making the deal on the entry, making it, but it's also how I'm going to get rid of this deal once I do make it, right? So it's having a lot of exit strategies, which are also important. So knowing more ways to get into a deal and knowing more ways how to get out of it will be definitely helpful. Just like that sub two deal I was just talking about, you know, that sub two deal, I could have bought that house for 70,000. I could have put 15, 20 into it and did a fix and flip. And then four months, five months, put it on the market and hope I got all my money back and, and been profitable. I could have wholesaled that deal. I could have bought that on subject two and turn it into a rental for a very, very long term. Or I could just subtail it and put a couple of grand in closing costs and then make 15, 20 grand and just be done with it and just be in and out of a deal. So I have five different options. Which one do I want to do? First, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And then we decide and we go down the list and then we work it accordingly. So every house has a plan. It's not just an accident. So once you have a way to get into a deal and you've got four or five different ways to sell it off, or what you're going to do with it, it just makes life so much easier and you just stick to the plan and make money. So process is really big. If you all don't know, Gary Harper and Susan Harper with Sharper Solutions, um, they've coached us recently. It's like $20,000 for three months, four months. These guys are wonderful. The things they really break down and narrow down are processes. And it really boils down to having amazing processes and sticking to it. And once you figure those out, which we will continue to share with you guys, what we've learned with them and all the others, it's a lot, it's challenging. It's no easy thing, but it is, uh, the checks are nice and it's a lot of fun and it is definitely uh, worth it. So next week, we're going to go into how we screen buyers. We're going to go over some situations. I'm going to do more deal breakdowns too. Um, real quick, just want to make sure I do, I do like before we hang up, I'll stop the uh, recording before we do that. Can you explain the part about how the 60K equity was structured in your deal? So yeah, I could go over that real quick. So we, buyer grades at 290, he owes 230. Uh, what's called a wrapped mortgage, I just wrapped my new price, one mortgage around that 290 price. So I have 60,000 of equity plus the 230 balance at 290. They're just wrapped in one, new mortgage, so the 60,000 is in there. And the payment is not based on 290. The payment is based on what his current mortgage is. And the pay down is the same exact rate of what his is. So what happens is I write in our agreement, I get a most recent mortgage statement. So I'm just gonna round this up and say he owed exactly 230. It was probably you know 229 and some change or 231, whatever. But let's just say for 230, I'm gonna write on our agreement that I'm buying for $290,000. And that I owe my seller $60,000 of equity. That's their money that they're going to get at up to. And then we put in the term that we agreed on, which is $30,000 or which is 30 years. So their money gets wrapped into that one deal at that 290 going from my company, my land trust to the seller. That's who the mortgage goes through. And the mortgage is just a piece of paper. It's a promissory note saying that they're going to pay one. And then I'm going to pay him that 290 payment or at 290 price, and I'm going to pay that $1,700 payment. And then they'll get their 60000 between when I get them refinanced. And the conversation I go with the seller was that, you know, we're going to work with a tenant buyer 
and they're going to get refinanced. It might take me three years. It might take me five. It might take me 10. Nobody knows. But once I do, that's when you'll get your money. Good news is I'm taking care of everything else and then you payments, all that. And he said, sounds good to me. Where do I sign? I said, right there. And it was that easy. And then I had to fight the guy to give him a hundred dollar deposit because he didn't even want it. And I'm telling him, you got to take it. It's mandatory. You got to have this hundred dollar deposit. And he's like, no, 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 save it. And I'm like, no, you have to take it. It's a hundred dollars. Take your wife out to dinner. And he's like, oh, I guess so. And I'm having my wife Venmo him a hundred bucks while I'm sitting at the table. So um, hundred dollar down deal guys. There you go. So how do we make them? We get the lead gen. We'll go over lead gen. We're going to definitely go over um, how to look at these deals. So half a tenner. Okay. So I'm going to hit pause. Okay. So